rund um die Insel. Hi, this is Elon Huang and welcome to the special online version of Rund um die Insel. The special online version is in English because recently I talked to Dr. Leo Chong Yun from the Institute for Chinese Literature and Philosophy from the Academia Sinica here in Taipei about the famous Chinese novel Xi O Ji in English Journey to the West. I already broadcasted the translated, i.e. German version, but it was such an entertaining and interesting interview that I would like to share the original interview so more people can listen to it. My name is Chong Yun Liu, or Liu Chong Yun. I work in Academia Seneca in the Institute of Chinese Literature and Philosophy. And um, my research interest is, is in Chinese novels and particularly Chinese literatures of the 16th, 17th century. And you want to talk about one of it today, Xiu Ji. Yes. Uh, why and when did you get interested in Xiu Ji? Xiu Ji is it's a very famous novel, so I guess for anyone growing up in the Chinese world, we know it since we were little and we read the kids' version. But I think the time when I, uh, I was really, really attracted to it, was during my graduate school years when I was preparing for my graduate school exam and we are required to read the major novels in Chinese literary history and then I very carefully reread this novel and found it first uh, way more interesting than I thought before just because the conversation in the novel. It's very lively and they, they always poke fun at each other and sometimes they even debate with each other. Um, especially the novel's language, you can divide it into the poetry and then the prose narrative. And the poetry is, is a lot more about the religious um, images, symbols, significance, and the prose part is like the plot of the story and some a lot of times they actually debate with each other so in, it's the language side that um, really got me interested in the novel the second part is the the characterization all the major characters when i read them very carefully i realized that none of them are like perfect they all have their own flaws but then their flaws or their um, strengths complement each other, and that um, that stimulates a lot of thoughts in me. So, why is particular character written that way? What's the relationship between these characters and that characters? And as a whole of the five characters, what does it mean to put them together? Yeah. So that got um, me into my own journey with this novel. Like when you graduated. Did you already or immediately want to do research about this? Or? Yeah, I actually choose this novel as my dissertation topic. Mm -hmm. At that time, at first, I want to talk about the comic language and the dialectic meaning in the novel. And then I realized it's... It, this novel is a lifetime's job. So of course, I finished my dissertation and focusing on the topic that I just mentioned. But then I realized that um, there's a lot more. First of all, um, the religious aspects that we talked about earlier, it's not one religion. It's Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism all put together in the novel and then represented in a new way. Like I think in, in the uh, novelist, very fresh light. That means um, if you really want to have a deep understanding of the novel, you need to know the three religions mm -hmm. plus you know the the history of Chinese literature. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Yeah, so so I I finished my dissertation, but I never leave this work aside. It always made me want to know more. So. I just, whenever possible, I, I studied some Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, and I read more work in classical Chinese. And also with my self growing up, aging, with more um, real life experiences. Every time I think about a novel, I reread it. I, I have different interpretations and fresh understandings. That's why I think this book is so fascinating. 
So you mentioned already there are five persons or five main figures, but could you a little bit summarize COG or how would you summarize COG? It's basically a pilgrimage of five characters working together to achieve the mission. The mission is to go from China to India, well, to, to the Western heaven, mm -hmm. um, to get the real, the authentic scriptures and bring it back to China. So to make it very simple, the story is like this. However, I think what makes this novel especially interesting is that it didn't start with this on, this journey only. There is a pre-journey. The pre-journey features the number one protagonist in the novel. That's what I think a lot of readers might know. We call it the Monkey King. Okay. And so it starts with the birth of the Monkey King. And it's not born by a father and a mother. It's born out of a stone. It's kind of like a stone birth. I think it, it has a special meaning in the novel because the stone is in the very top of the mountain in the eastern sea, where in traditional um, Chinese world that's considered uh, where the Sorry. immortals. <laughs> yeah, and then so the stones lying at, at, the, at the very top of the mountain inhaled the purest air and the, the wind, the rain for thousands of years. And then one day it has a spirit and it becomes something, this consciousness, it feels something. And then from the stone, burst out of a stone monkey. So in a way, I think why this novel also attracts a lot of like young readers is because this monkey, he, he very much resembles a child, a child's birth, and everything the purest, um, the, the simplest, but also such clarity in his, in, in his mind. It's very much like human beings, um, that innocence. And then because of that innocence, and then because of the brilliance that he inherited from the essence of the, of the cosmos, he is someone who cares about life and death, the deeper questions of life, and then he decided to leave his home country, which is the happy flower fruit mountains. Basically, if he doesn't have so many philosophical questions. He can just live there eating fruits all his life and then playing wild. <laughs> but he, that's not him, right? So he wanted to seek the true way, the ultimate truth with life. And also, more practically, he wants to transcend death. He doesn't want to die. So he wants to find out a way to do that. So he started his journey. He went west um, to other lands where the humans lands. His upbringing was in the monkey's kingdom, right? So when he went to the human's land, he learned human languages, he dressed like humans, but then he also starts to take up the flaws of humans. He be developed the idea of self, and when you have the idea of self, you have the idea of fame. You cared about your name. You want people to know you, and then you want to be better than others. And so that self kind of grow and grow. Um, in the first seven chapters, the novel depicts this pre-journey of the monkey. And something interesting is that when you look at the names, because at the very beginning he doesn't have a name, right? he's a stone monkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, but over his like, personal journey, he starts to take up different names for himself. So at first he called himself the handsome monkey king. And then he becomes the sage that equals heaven. And then he thinks that he can alone come back all the immortals in the celestial world. So he thinks, like, there's so much I can do. So on the one hand, he does develop the most potentials of, say, human beings or from the, the core goodness and intelligence of a sentient being. However, that full development could be dangerous. It is, is it a completely good thing? We can ask ourselves, right? I think our world is, is also like this. We're trying to develop mm -hmm. a lot. There's huge advancement in lots of things. Yeah. It looks like human beings are more powerful than any time in the history of human beings. But do we think that's something entirely positive? Um, so there, there is a parallel 
here. And this is something I just started to think about recently. So mm-hmm. again, coming back to, to, to my saying earlier that the novel always like stirs up a lot of things, a lot of thoughts in me. This is a little bit more superficial, but it reminds me of like kids, like when they start playing a sport or whatever, and they, they are friends. Like they're like six, seven years old and they play soccer or basketball or tennis together and they're friends. Right. And then they start to become better. Right. And then they start to become jealous of each right. other or they want to beat each other right. and they say, I'm better than you and right, stuff. Right. That reminds right. me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if we go back to the plot outline that I just gave, yes, it, it's just a scripture seeking journey. It can be that simple. However, throughout the journey, there's a lot of psychological drama, mm-hmm. just like what Elon mentioned. There's jealousy between monkey and and other disciples of Tripitaka that we call Pixie because Mm -hmm. he was um, a pig spirit. But before he was a pig spirit, he was actually a celestial general. So he had a much grander former life. So that's not interesting thing about the novels, right? The character, it's there are different layers, a different phase of the universe in different time. You can be a different thing, yeah. and they are all part of you, right? This um, pixie, I think in his former life, he was a celestial general, and he fights demons, subdue demons. But because he made a small mistakes in heaven, as a punishment, he was sent down to the, the human world, and he became a pig spirit. And that represents all the, the, the desire human desires, uh-huh. the basic desires, yeah. lust, gluttony, and laziness. Yeah. It's just very common. We all have that, <laughs> that flaws in us. Right? Um, so pixie becomes that. So, so there is a, the, the jealousy between the two. The pixies, you fight, I can fight too. I can, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that worse than you. Yeah. But also he has his own flaws. Mm. Whereas for monkey, in, in terms of the personality, he is the opposite of pixie. He's super active, not yeah. lazy at all, but too active. <laughs> and he has a temper. And that the temper is related to his care about his fame. Um, it's very funny whenever, who, whatever demons that encounter, monkey, his, one of his major concerns is, have you heard of my name, <laughs> the sage who equals heaven? You know my past? <laughs> and so if that demon knew that, he, the monkey would feel much better. Okay, you're a good demon. But if the demon didn't hear that, he would be very, very angry. And let me show you how good I am. So, <laughs> so that, that's basically the, the setup of his character. But, mm. you know, a lot of fun can be derived yeah. out of this like characterization. So there is a, a lot of this psychological drama. But it's not only drama. It kind of reminds us to think about all kinds of the human qualities, whether they are virtues, there are flaws. We just talk about flaws, but we can also talk about virtues. Tripitaka, he is supposed to represent virtues, right? He's the master in, in Chinese history. This is a real historical character, and he's really an eminent monk. And in actual history, he did a lot of awesome things, like he did travel by himself um, to India, and although with some maybe some companions, but still, I think at, at that time, it's, it's a huge enterprise. And then he translated like many, many scriptures from Sanskrit to Chinese. However, in the novel, I think he was represented as someone who is very compassionate, but sometimes probably over compassionate to the extent that he might be blinded by his greatest virtue. And that makes us wonder and also required us to rethink what this virtue means. It's not that we don't cultivate virtues, but I think it's more about raising the awareness that for whatever kinds of virtue, when we push it to the extreme, it could be something dangerous. I think in our time, excellence is probably, the, the pursuit for excellence is probably a virtue. Mm. Okay, But if we push that to the extreme, we forget about how to face failures and flaws. Okay. And, and so the, the novel, under the facade of like very funny plots and fantastic creatures' fightings, I think it's also digging in uh, very deep into like humans' inner self. Mm-hmm. Sometimes different virtues, they can complement or correct each other. So maybe the wisest way 
to lead a good life is not to embrace a particular virtue, mm. but to have many virtues in front of you and observe very carefully how to make them work together in a most balanced way. I think that's the lesson I learned from the novel. Listening to you, like now I get the idea how much deeper the book is or the story is than I thought when I first heard about it. Like mm. the first time I heard about it was like, like when I was 10 years old mm. and I watched like the old cartoon version from the mm. 60s. Mm. And also later when I watched other movies or like read like the children version, I always thought, oh, this is such a cool adventure story. And only when I came to Taiwan, someone suddenly told me, oh, there's, there's, about, there's something about Buddhism in it mm. and, and, and uh, Confucianism. Can you talk a little bit about the religious theme of the book? The very first time I thought a little bit about religion in this book is when the Guanyin Bodhisattva mm -hmm. visited the Jade Emperor. Right. And I thought, oh, okay, this is a nice symbol for Chinese tolerance and religion, right. like Buddhism and, and Taoism together. Mm -hmm. But there's much more. Can you talk a little bit more about this, the religion in this book? Yeah, of course. But I'll try, because sometimes mm -hmm. that it's a little bit complicated. Um, but I'll try to make it simple, see yeah. if I can do it. Okay, so of course, on the surface, it's more the journey to in quest for the scriptures. That's a Buddhist thing, yeah. right? But even within Buddhism, there are different schools of Buddhism. And we just said that compassion is one key teaching of Buddhism. However, it also talks about impermanence. Life is impermanent. Everything we see in this world, we think is real, is actually illusion. So that's basically the, the debate between monkey and uh, Tripitaka, right? One upholds compassion. Monkey is always telling the master, you are not seeing the true reality. Mm -hmm. This is not a beautiful woman or a poor child. It's a demon. Okay, So really what we see, the world, like, what we think is real, what, what is it really? And so already there is the debate. And sometimes in, in say, li religious cultivation, compassion is, is right. But what is the right kind of compassion? Just within Buddhism, there is its own debate. But of course, in, in the Chinese Buddhist tradition, they all have their very sophisticated development. It's not that they cannot complement with, with each other, but there's a lot more in there. And then the other thing is, okay, you have the realization, but compassion itself is not enough, right? So what do we actually do in our daily life? Um, so in the Taoist aspects, there is a very concrete way of self-cultivation. What do you do? One is like more bodily, like the, the qi, the energy you inhale. Like we know tai chi, right? So it's similar to that. How do you guide the qi in your body and to replenish your body and um, to, to keep yourself safe and sound and healthy? And I think in that way, if you look at the team as a body. So how does the five characters work together? That provides some very actual steps. Okay, how do we do that? Okay. So it's in the on the everyday life basis, every encounter, every new country, every new demon you encounter, you have particular acts that you need to do and then how do you make the right judgments? There's that. And even Confucianism, you can say in the earlier time when Buddhism just um, came into China, there is a major debate because in Buddhism, since this world is impermanent, you should leave your house, leave your family, become a Sangha. Okay? And for Confucianism, in traditional Chinese society, family is the core of everything. That's where your responsibility um, lies. So it becomes a little bit hard to mm -hmm. reconcile the two. So you'll see that over the time when Buddhism developed in China, they are trying to re reconcile the two. So it's not 
it's not that only in the novel, like the three religions, they, they start to dialogue with, with each other. Before the novel, it's been, it's been like this for hundreds of years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but just at the time of the novel, the kind of dialogue has developed into a very ripe stage that kind of naturally the novelists just bring them all together here. So you'll see that all the things that they do, right, they save the ki- children in particular kingdom, they help to get rain in other kingdoms. Of course, in the past, eminent monks also do this. But also, in the Confucian frames, it also counts for social responsibilities. And you'll see monkeys, as much as he has his bad tempers and he quarrels with his masters, but he always come back to save him. Um, he has no family. The only family he has, or he considers he has, is actually his master. Okay, so you actually also see a kind of like Chinese like family r- relationship, but, but not like biological family, but that kind of like like master-disciple relationship. Hmm. And you also see that Tripitaka, he got a mission from the emperor, right? So he's always con- concerning that oh, I, I need to complete this mission that the emperor gave me. And the emperor, before Tripitaka set off, the emperor and Tripitaka, they become like some sort of like bound brothers. So mm-hmm. they, they have an other ties. Oh, okay. So you see all these relationships like working together. Yeah, so that, that's how this novel has all these aspects. There is like the Confucian family relationship. Okay, and but family in in a, like a broader sense, and there is a Taoist self cultivation process. Um, then Buddhism, there is the debate between illusion and reality, compassion, and what's true compassion. Yeah. And is there a political aspect in this book? I think you talked about it uh, on BBC, like Mao liked it, and also a friend of mine told me in their political studies they used the book because. It talks about bureaucracy. Yes. So there's a political aspect in the book. Is it on purpose by the author, or is it just something we put into this book? Okay. Well, I think there are two aspects. At the time of the novel, I think the the novelist um, he has his own critique mm-hmm. of the politics of his time. Many scholars would say it's about those kings. Um, in, in a few kingdoms who kind of indulge themselves in the wrong kind of Taoism. Like um, they want to eat children or eat um, whatever that mm-hmm. can just, just um, um, prolong their lives. Mm-hmm. Okay, And so there is that. But I think for that kind of political critique, it's not that strong in the original. The probably more interesting part is that when we enter into the modern time, the novel, especially the first seven chapters, we talk about the monkey's journey. It can be a great story of rebellion. And yeah. that coincide with the age of revolution in China. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for the novel itself, this only constitutes the first seven chapters. There are 93 chapters afterwards. Mm-hmm. He's trying to address just um, the wrong that's done yeah. in the first seven chapters. However, if we extract the first seven chapters out only, then you can very easily make it into a story of monkey's triumph mm-hmm. over the bureaucracy in the celestial court. And then you can see for Mao, for the Communist Party, it's something very useful. First because of the popularity of the novel, and then they reshape the monkey into a true hero, like mm-hmm. the kid's personal flaws doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> In fact, that's not even flaws, you know, that's yeah. his strength because he has the daringness to, to, to face all this seemingly insurmountable, like, heavenly court. So I think in the 1950s, there is an animation made in China called Da Nao Tian Gong, yeah. which is basically mon- monkey wreck havoc in, in the, the heaven. Um, that's very, very popular. I remember uh, when I was a grad student in the States and my my classmates from China, knowing that I'm going to write a dissertation on Xi Yuji, 
she immediately bought me this Da Nao Tengong <laughs> animation. Oh, you should see this. We all watched this when we were a kid. Yeah. And what's very interesting is that in that animation, the first chap, the first seven chapter, the ending was changed. The monkey was not subjugated oh, right. under yeah. the mountain. Uh -huh. He just basically successfully overthrow. I think the end is he's jumping out of the oven and he is like... Right, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And then all the monkeys, they regain new freedoms mm -hmm. and then now this is like a carefree yeah. world for the proletariat, right? For the mm -hmm. monkey. Yeah, so it's very interesting that the novel, um, you just give it a small twist and it means something yeah. very, very different. You also talk about the flaws about uh, of these characters. I think... Yeah, most of young people favorite Sun Wukong, mm -hmm. and but also you talked about his failures or his flaws and stuff, mm -hmm. and also the monk, mm -hmm. he always drove me nuts. Like <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's whining, but this uh, flaw does it also go for the Jade Emperor, for example? Because mm -hmm. I think yeah, he's the big person, as the Jade Emperor, but in my opinion, he is not often like fair or right, just right, right. and honestly he's probably like kind of helpless he's just like sitting there on right. his throne and without his uh, other generals he's helpless right. so but he's supposedly like the big god there right. is that do you think that's a difference between chinese religion and for example the religion of christianity islam judaism because I think in Christianity, Islam, like the God there is, is uh, what's called um, perfect and almighty. Mm, right. But the straight emperor is not, I right. think. Do you think that's a that's a important difference between the religions? Yeah, I guess so. I kind of hesitant to make like a big claim because I, mm -hmm. I, I'm really not an expert on, say, Christian Islam. I, I know some of it, but it's, it's not my expertise. But I would say that For me, it's worth noticing that in the novel, even the gods are not perfect. Yeah. And I think it's deliberate. And of course, also in Chinese tradition, the Chinese religion, whether Buddhism, Taoism, we have a huge pantheon yeah. yeah, of, of gods, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And they usually they have their own stories. And it can develop locally. It can sometimes novels enhance it. So there's not only one God is upheld the highest, and mm. it has to be like perfect and uh, all almighty. Um, I think in that aspect, it's, it's different. So if even gods have the flaws, th that's in the novel. I, I probably wouldn't say it's... We, we need to distinguish within the novel and in the Chinese uh, religious tradition, because mm. I, I probably I can't say that, oh, Chinese religion, you know, they don't care about whether their gods are virtuous or perfect. Still, I think in, in the culture of worshiping, still, they try to present the god as mm -hmm. perfect as possible. Yeah. But I think the insight of the novel is that the true goodness or wisdom doesn't rely on just a god or the gods. Mm -hmm. It's self-transformation. And this is also not that new, because in the long Chinese religious tradition, Buddhism, and Taoism, they all have their own manuals of self-cultivation. However, the novel is saying that as ordinary people, sometimes it could be hard to do it all by ourselves. So it's a work of a team, right? Mm -hmm. you, you work with people also with flaws. And sometimes you may fight, you may dislike each other, but sometimes you are just bound together. I think in real <laughs> life, it, it happens yeah. all the time, yeah. right? <laughs> but you, you don't just leave because I don't want to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You are bound together, but there are ways you can work together. So sometimes I, when, when I grow older and I know, I, I experience a lot of difficulties in real life, And I come back to read this novel, I think it's telling me this. You, you withstand. You, you may leave temporarily, but you'll come back together. And in one episode after another episode, mm. eventually you achieve something. Even though they didn't really get the most perfect scriptures, because the most perfect scriptures cannot be represented in written forms. And But to take something back to China for people to be able to read, It has to be written for. So it's like the second best, but mm. not the best mm -hmm. scriptures, because basically that one is unattainable and intangible. Okay, so everything is just 
okay, good, but not perfect. But maybe for the novelist, that's the best. <laughs> <Yeah> . The not so good is the best. Mm. The the group of flow people fighting, quarreling all the way, um, and do something together. That's good enough. Yeah. And I think that's a very how to say that observation of human life. I think it's brilliant. One more person I want to complain about is the Bodhisattva. <laughs> Recently, watched this old series from the 1980s to tame or to control the Monkey King. Mm -hmm. The Bodhisattva gives the monk a, a golden ring to put on right. the monkey's head, right. and every time the monkey does something the the monk doesn't like, he, he says some sutra or something mm -hmm. like that, and then the Monkey King gets a real big headache. Right. When I read about it in the book or before, like. Just like okay, it's a little punishment. I never thought much about it, but when I watched the show, and like they made it like really, really painful, and then mm -hmm. I thought like mm, that's kind of mean, especially since the Bodhisattva and the monk they always talk about mercy and forgiveness, but right. then they punish him in such a strong way. Right. Is there some symbolism to this, or like yeah, is there something yeah. more to yeah. this? Yeah, well, I, I I completely understand your feelings. What I learned later on is that I think the novel, okay, the kind of cruelty that we sense when we read the monkey being like tightly strained by that happens, probably has to do with how much the novelist understand the danger of human nature, and that might have to do with his time. Overall, the society in the 16th century is a time of lots of commerce, material gains,、uh, material growth. So I think that when we talk about Pixie's lust, when reading other literary works of that time, you do feel that the people at that time they worry about it. It's two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, they celebrate it because. A merchandise you've never seen, books, all the goods,、mm. not available before, now become available. No matter your social classes, you as long as you have money, you can wear the best kind of clothes, use the best kind of fans, and all, all the luxuries. But then you also observe human hearts, how it might get depraved, corrupt、mm -hmm. by that. And also in the bureaucracy, you see, and the connections and the monies and everything.、Yeah. So, and also how the eagles. It has to do with the thought of that time, because that's also the time when Wang Yangming's philosophy of the mind that everybody can be a sage. Of course, this is something very liberating, right? Everyone、mm -hmm. has the seed of good nature, just like the monkey. However, again, this. Model. If you drive it to the extreme, it's very dangerous. The monkey thinks himself can be a sage、yeah. that equals to the heaven. So I think people of the time really see humans' heart running wild, attracted to to fame, care a lot more about the self. And is it good or bad? What might be the potential danger? I think in this novel, the novelist is. Very keenly aware of that danger. That's how later on I came to understand、um, why that simile, a little violent image, that the constraint has to be so tight. Of course, I I still think we don't have to like every part of the novel. It's、mm. also we can reflect upon it just、um, when we think about self cultivation. You always have to strain yourself. Discipline yourself, but what is the right amount of discipline?、Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something we we can still talk about today. Not saying that the novel gives us the the one correct answer,、mm. but the question that he posed, I think, is still worth thinking. Some time ago, you were invited to the BBC show in our time to talk about Xiuji. We are surprised about the interest in Xiuji, especially like in, in the Western country. Mm, yes and no. I know that、uh, Xiu Ji say in universities over the world.、Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I know I have friends or I know people doing translations of this novel into many different languages. So I guess in universities or in the academia, 
that kind of attention doesn't surprise me. However, um, when I received the invitation from BBC to the general listening or reading publics, the BBC they would consider doing an episode on COT. That for me is a happy surprise. Mm-hmm. And also, I very much appreciate their insight. I mm-hmm. do think this is a work that's worth the efforts to introduce to wider mm-hmm. readers, what, whatever their cultural background is. Do you think COG is still interesting for Taiwan or for Taiwanese? At the moment, many people say we have mm-hmm. nothing to do with China. Mm-hmm. So, are there still many people interested in this book? Or, or is it still interesting mm-hmm. for Taiwanese? Yeah, I think it, it, it still is, and mainly because of the mythological, fantastical elements mm-hmm. in the novel. It's, it's actually not that historical. Yeah. So in a sense, whether it's from China or not, even the content itself, it's just really about adventures of mm-hmm. like um, strange creatures or just human beings and in general, or yeah. like... Um, interesting, I don't know, celestial beings and demon spirits. So that kind of take off the, the particular Chinese-ness of the text. Another thing that's what I notice when teaching in universities, um, there is a trend that the youngsters nowadays are, are quite interested in non-humans. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes in academia, so we, we talk about these non-human turns in um, research interest. Mm-hmm. And this may have to do with our concern with the environment, right? We are human beings and no longer the central concern of many scholars. Or, or we start to question ourselves, like, do we, do we really do good to the world or are we actually destroyed more than so people's attention are drawn to nature and also the non-humans because the non-humans provides a mirror for us to reflect yeah. so what human beings are and following that tr- trend I think she or she also fits into this corpus of work um, last question there are many movies and series about she or she. have you watched all of them and then like which one is your favorite yeah, I actually haven't watched all of them. In fact, I would say I watched only a few of them. Okay. Well, first being there are too many. And the other thing is, you know, when you render them in movies and in TVs, you need to create a monkey, right? Mm-hmm. Create a pixie, right? Yeah. And it's very interesting, actually, think about it. We all know monkey is a monkey, but it's not really a monkey. It's a human and monkey. Yeah. Right? We always make it some in a way that we humans can feel relatable. Yeah. So really, I think there can be many ways of rendering. When I was looking at the illustrations in, in the 16th, 17th century, so one thing that I, I look for particularly is how they render these characters. And I just feel like whenever it's in movie or um, TV, the way it's rendered, I prefer the one in my own mind. No. <laughs> um, so there's that. And my favorite, I don't know. I prob- I, there's probably not. I can talk about certain ones and what's unique about them. But so far, I don't have my favorite one. Sorry, my favorite one was still in the books. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you showed me some books. I've never seen them with the pictures, and this is awesome. <laughs> like, uh, this is, uh, opens a totally new world. Yep. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. It's my pleasure. Yeah. It's, it's, thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I love the conversation. That was the original English version of my talk with Dr. Leo Chong Yun from the Institute for Chinese Literature and Philosophy from the Academia Sinica about the famous Chinese novel Xiu Ji, Journey to the West. Thanks for listening.